Welcome to our webinar entitled Republic Act No. 11534 or the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprise Act, otherwise known as the CREATE Act. I'm Attorney Arnold De Abdua and I will be glad to share my knowledge and experience about taxation. And in case if you have questions or clarifications or do you want to discuss you want me to discuss any topic about taxation, well you just have to contact me through the QR code that you will see on the screen. So I'll be giving you five seconds to point your camera to the QR code if you don't have my contact details yet. Let us now proceed with our discussion. We all know that tax system is dynamic and it changes every now and then. That's true, right? And because of several factors affecting our environment, the government is required or let's say forced to change certain provisions of the tax code. Actually, in my seven years of being an employee of the Bureau of Internal Revenue until 2011, I always make it a point to na maging updated din ako sa BIR rules and regulations kasi nga lagi siyang nagbabago. But surprisingly, one significant factor affecting our tax system is competition. Surprisingly, bakit competition? Let us remember that the world is getting smaller and smaller and investors are now looking at different countries where they can invest their money. But are the Philippine tax rates and incentives competitive enough to encourage investors, whether domestic or foreign investors, to do business in the Philippines? Well, yan ang malalaman natin as we discuss the CREATE Act. Also, the government addresses certain problems or issues faced by our country. Most especially right now, we are faced by the COVID-19 pandemic, which is crucial to businesses. So, ano ba ginagawa ng government natin to help the economy? Well, one of the answers is the passage of the CREATE law. Our government exerts effort to adjust to current situation despite the task of collecting taxes. Always remember that in terms of businesses, our country is also competing with other countries, most especially with members of the ASEAN region. We have Singapore, Brunei, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Myanmar. But take note that we do not have the same incentives compared with other countries. And as you can see in the slide, in 2020, Singapore has the lowest corporate tax rates at 17% and the Philippines has 30% corporate income tax. It means that we are collecting more taxes compared with ASEAN countries and this will not make the Philippines competitive in other countries. Even here in the Philippines, ang tanong ng mga Pilipino, how much tax should I pay in case I set up my own business? Magkano ang tax na babayaran ng businesses? Well, if we have higher corporate income tax rates, it actually discourages investors to do business in the Philippines. There's a smaller chance of competing with other countries. Looking at the slide, Myanmar imposes 25% corporate income tax, a 5% gap with the Philippine corporate income tax. Well, if we will compute that to billions of pesos, that's a big amount already, no? There will be a lot of investors who would prefer of doing business in Myanmar kasi makakasave sila. But what's really interesting is that the countries such as Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos only impose 20% corporate income tax. That is another edge by other countries compared with the Philippines. So if we will look at the investor's perspective in terms of taxation, they would definitely prefer countries that impose lower corporate income tax. That is one of the reasons why the Philippine government decreased the corporate income tax. Because there is a possibility that there will be lesser businesses in the Philippines in the future, whether micro, small, medium, and large enterprises, than other ASEAN countries. But also, remember, kapag sinabi natin taxation, it's not always a burden on the part of the taxpayer. It is also used as a tool to invite or encourage individuals or entities to do business in the Philippines, and most especially in certain priority industries. It may be used as an incentive in a sense that if the government wants to develop a particular industry like in the Philippines, where exporter of goods and services have a great impact to our economy, then the government may give incentives to that industry to bring in more investors, generate employment, and increase our gross national product. But actually, these incentives may be utilized efficiently or be prone to abuse. 
That's the reason why the government decided to review the tax incentives currently given to businesses such as exporters and domestic market enterprise. Kasi nga, baka yung intention ng mga incentives eh hindi na nagagamit sa tamang paraan. No? So other ASEAN countries like Myanmar, Brunei, Malaysia, and Indonesia have tax incentives or perks ranging from 18 to 25 years. But if you would look at the slide, take note, Prior to the CREATE law or the CREATE Act, the Philippines has been generous in granting those tax incentives. For example, a PESA registered entity may initially enjoy income tax holiday. Oh, alam naman natin na pag income tax holiday, walang babayaran income tax. But after such income tax holiday, what will happen is that the PESA entity may be subject to the 5% preferential tax rate in lieu of all internal revenue taxes, both local and national, sa mga registered activities niya. And take note, take note ha, compared with the other countries, there's no time limits availment and pwedeng perpetual yung enjoyment ng tax incentives. Thus, it is prone to abuse. And it defeats the purpose of giving tax incentives. Sabi daw eh, walang forever no? pagdating sa tax incentives. And that led to the passage of the CREATE Act where the government intends to rationally develop our economy through global competitiveness. Diba? I have shown to you earlier that the Philippines had the highest income tax rates among the ASEAN countries. Sa mga investors, parang pupunta lang din sila sa Divisoria, they may find the same product, item specification, pero they would also want to find the lowest price. Ganon din sa atin. So it means actually the focus here is attracting investors, okay? Not only domestic market enterprise, but also to incentivize foreign investors. And with such move, actually, it will result to the following. First is... Productivity enhancement. Because foreign countries or investors may bring in new technology or techniques in doing business. Well, if we will look at other countries, let's say Japan, Korea, they are more advanced in terms of technology and they may bring that technology here in the Philippines. Also, we have to consider that foreigners or let's say investors may generate employment. It means more Filipinos will have more job opportunities, lalong-lalo na ngayon no? sa COVID-19 pandemic, marami ang nawalan ng trabaho. Also, we have to consider countrywide development. Um, our government also focuses on the development of certain regions or provinces. Take note, the Philippines is, in, is an archipelagic country where it has several islands, di ba? Depende kung high tide or low tide, pero... We remember that these islands should also be developed aside from the metropolis, aside from Manila, Cebu, and Davao. Alright? We also have to consider inclusive growth, which means that economic growth is di distributed fairly across society and creates opportunities for all. So, nagkakaroon ng equal distribution of wealth. Hindi lang yung mga mayaman yung talagang yung, yung laging yung mayaman. No, there's an opportunity for others to share in the wealth of the country. Okay? And also, its intention is to maintain fiscal prudence and stability. It may mean we may have insulated government funding from the effect of financial market conditions and have sufficient buffer against economy shock. So, parang kahit na yung mga ASEAN countries na kala, ka, kapitbahay natin ay eh, naapektuhan na ng certain recession or um, crisis, our country will still be able to keep afloat as to its economy. And to give you a glimpse of the effect of the CREATE Act in 2021, the Philippines now imposes 25% corporate income tax, Okay, similar to Myanmar. If we can recall, in 2018, the Philippines enacted the train law, which actually adjusted the personal income tax rates of individuals. Because before the train law, we also have the highest income tax rates for individuals. Where if a person earns, let's say, a taxable income of more than 500,000, subject na kagad sa 32%. Pero now, only those with net taxable income of over 8 million, uh, 2 million, I mean, to 8 million are subject to 32% income tax. But some of you will observe that 25% is still far from the 20% corporate income tax no? imposed by our 
neighbor countries such as Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and Laos. Well, actually, the government, the Philippine government also considered the micro, small, and medium enterprises or the MSMEs, okay? They have a great contribution to our economy. Thus, the CREATE Act also has lower corporate income tax rates for MSMEs. The slide shows that for those corporate entities classified as MSMEs, which we will discuss later, they will be liable to pay only 20% corporate income tax on their net taxable income. So, mas mababa dun sa 25% corporate income tax mentioned earlier. You may note that Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia all have also their MSME rates significantly lower than the Philippines. Si Thailand actually 15%. Si Indonesia 11%. And Malaysia it's 17%. But I believe... Despite of such a rate, we still have advantage because our country is an English-speaking country where investors from America and European region find it easy to deal with us. Diba? Also, upon the effectivity of the CREATE Act, the fiscal incentives or tax perks given to certain industries in the Philippines were revised. We now have a maximum of 40 years tax incentives. Similar to Singapore, available to certain businesses and industries. This will now level the playing field between businesses and industries. Hindi na pwedeng perpetual yung incentives kasi sabi ko nga kanina, it may be prone to abuse. So the items that I show to you is just a glimpse of the effect of the CREATE Act. What I would like to discuss is actually the actual provisions. Always remember, it is important to know the law itself before the implementing rules and regulations. You may have seen actually a lot of infographics or summary in social media about the CREATE Act. I'm not biased about those information because it's a good source of information. But as accountants, lawyers, and business owners, we should know the legal basis in imposing those taxes. You will ask bakit naging 25 and 30% corporate income tax? Anong basis or saan ba siya nasusulat? So, sasabihin natin tulad kay Brad Pitt, basa. Okay? So, let us now proceed and know what the law provides. But as we proceed with the discussion, inform ko lang kayo that you will see that sa body ng slides, there are different colors of text shown. I will tell you that yung blue, um, not the title, ah, yung sa body, um, yung blue refers to the new provisions, then red color naman yung mga removed provisions or amended portions, yung black is for the existing provisions prior to the CREATE Act. So mamaya mag magugulat kayo bakit iba-iba yung kulay no? nung nasa slide. Pero... It's like uh, nag-edit tayo ng word file with track changes feature. Alright? Let us start with section 20 where the Commissioner of Internal Revenue upon order of the Secretary of Finance is required to submit information and justification in granting tax incentives. As we all know, the BIR has vast information in terms of tax incentives given to enterprises because they are the ones who receive the tax returns of businesses. Kasi if you will look at the income tax returns, but the taxpayer will be asked if it is enjoying income tax exemption or covered ng tax treaty. So, this is helpful in generating information as to the tax incentives. Another item amended is the order of this provision from letter B to C because of the previously discussed provision. So, it also changed the word chairman to chairpersons to in relation to gender sensitivity. no, So, hindi lang actually tax ang pinag-uusapan natin. Even gender sensitivity. Another section amended this section 22 where it added the word one-person corporations. For those who have attended my seminar regarding the revised corporation code, uh, it can be recalled that Republic Act Number no. 11232 took effect last 2019. And one significant change in the corporate landscape is allowing an individual to set up one person corporation aside from the sole proprietor in this case the congress also recognized the change and added the entity in the definition of corporation subject to the revised corporate income tax alam naman natin ang difference between one person corporation and the sole proprietor in terms of liability tama kapag one person corporation the liability of the corporation is separate from the single stockholder Pero sa sole proprietor, it extends to the personal assets of the owner. Also, I would say, if you're looking at the possibility of maximizing existing tax provisions, the one-person corporation may have better tax rates. 
compared with sole proprietors. As mentioned in my train law seminars, the tax rates for individuals range from 20% to 35%. While for corporations ngayon, 20 to 25%. No? And the 20% applies to MSME. So it is a wise move to register companies under one-person corporation. Take note, Hindi na kailangan ng five incorporators ha, under the revised corporation code. Maski one, two, three, or four individuals pwede na mag-set up ng corporation. Pahabol na tanong, kung, pa, kung pwede ng one-person corporation, pwede ba ako mag-evict ng mga kasama ko sa existing corporation? If they only held minimal shares, and sa akin naman talaga yung corporation, well, the answer is yes. You can change from regular domestic corporation to one-person corporation. Ang tanong is paano? That will be covered by another webinar. Or you can actually message us for further clarification. Also, Section 25 refers to tax on non-resident alien individuals. There is an amendment where it states that winnings from PCSO amounting to 10000 or less shall be exempt. It also remove yung tax exemption actually sa lotto winnings. Kasi before, kapag tumaya ka sa loto, that's tax exempt. Pero ngayon, tinanggal na. Okay? So, most of the changes sa individuals are actually in the train law. Hindi lang actually na-include tong tax on non-resident alien individual when the train law was passed. Let us now discuss the meat of the CREATE law or the CREATE Act, which is specifically for corporations. According to Section 27, the corporate tax rate upon effectivity of the 1997 tax code was 35%. Okay? But was reduced and prior to the CREATE Act, it was 30%. But effective July 1, 2020, so last July 1, 2020, the corporate income tax rate should be 25%. Some of you would ask, if this particular law will be retroactive in, in application since it was only signed this year, 2021. Well, it's very clear in the law that the rate that will apply for July 1, 2020 onwards is 25%. But as to how it will be computed, since most corporations are using calendar year, it will be based on the BIR's implementing rules and regulation. But actually, Section 27 already indicated that even prior to the CREATE Act, na kapag may possible disparity on the corporate income tax rates for a particular year, the sales, costs, and expenses are deemed to have been earned and incurred equally. So it means divided by, or yung iba sinasabi, divide, divide, no? By 12, then multiply the number of months. Also, this is, I guess, the most interesting part of the CREATE Act. Many business have already recognized that the regular corporate tax rate in the Philippines starting July 1, 2020 will be 25%. But this is one thing that they would really want to know. Most especially, all of us here, is there an amount lower than 25% that pwedeng applicable sa corporations? Uh, yes, there is. According to Section 27, in case a corporation will have a net taxable income not exceeding 5 million pesos and with total assets not exceeding 100 million pesos, excluding, take note, the land on which a particular business, office, plant, or equipment are located or situated, the tax that will apply is 20%. So take note, hindi lahat ng corporations are subject sa 20%. The condition is that the net taxable income should not exceed 5 million pesos and the total assets does not exceed 100 million pesos. This is now how MSMEs will be taxed as formulated by our legislators. Kapag lumagpas ka sa threshold na naka-indicate dito, you have to pay 25%. I would like to highlight also the deletion of certain provisions in Section 27 like the 15% gross income tax on corporations in my 7 years sa BIR from 2004 to 2011. Hindi ko na-encounter to na na-implement because of the conditions set no, ng tax code. So these are other provisions of the 15% gross income tax on corporations that were deleted. Okay? We will no longer dis discuss much of this since hindi naman masyado na utilize, no? Pero I recall na review ko ito in preparation for the board exams. These provisions were also removed such as the definition of gross income, cost of goods sold, 
Okay, so take note, these definitions are somehow similar to accounting definition or gap. There is lesser emphasis on these items. Okay, even the cost of goods manufactured okay, and sold and definition of gross income for services were deleted from section 27 of the tax code. The next item we will discuss is the tax on proprietary educational institutions and hospitals where originally they are required to pay a tax of 10% on their net taxable income except those covered by subsection D hereof. But beginning July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023, the tax rate imposed shall be 1%. So again, some of you will ask how the corporate income tax rate will be computed with such amendment. It will be based on the BIRs implementing rules and regulations. This portion naman is a rephrasing of which added private hospital, okay, aside sa private school as proprietary, okay? Kasi both naman are subject to the same lower corporate income tax rate of 1%. This also changed the Department of Culture and Sports or DEX to DepEd na lang or Department of Education which is the current name of the said government institution. Also, Section 27 indicates that uh, government-owned and controlled corporations may be subject to tax or exempt. Okay? Pero we know in the train law, PCSO was removed from the exempt corporations. But with the CREATE law, with the CREATE law, it actually added the Home Development Mutual Fund or the Pag-ibig in the exempt GOCCs. I would like to inform you also that in case of domestic corporations the receiving dividends from another domestic corporation, it is absolutely exempt from dividends tax as provided by the original tax code. No, This is the reason why there are several companies na nagsiset up na mga holding companies so that um, in case of dividends received by those holding companies, it will be exempt from dividends tax. But as I mentioned earlier, di ba? Even individuals now can set up one-person corporation. So if you want to set up a holding company and you as the single stockholder, pwede na as one-person corporation. And any dividend that you receive from other domestic corporations as one-person corporation will be exempt. Unlike kapag stockholder ka as an individual, normally any dividend that you receive as resident citizen or alien will be subject to take note 10% dividends tax but what is specifically added in this provision is the dividends received by a domestic corporation from a foreign source actually received or remitted in the Philippines it states that if these dividends are take note reinvested in the business operations of the domestic corporation in the Philippines within the next taxable year and limited to funding the working capital requirements, capital expenditures, and dividend payments including investment in subsidiaries in infrastructure project, it is also exempt from dividends tax. So it gives incentives to foreign reserves remitted to the Philippines and utilized in the Philippines. But the other condition that must be met is that the domestic corporation should hold directly. Take note, directly. So the records should show that the corporation is the one holding or owning the shares. So at least 20% of the outstanding shares of the foreign corporation and has held the shareholdings for a minimum of two years at the time the dividends distribution. So the threshold as to the holding period and ownership is are indicated in this slide. So, this also recognizes that business practices of companies investing already abroad, hindi lang local ang focus sa mga businesses, but also investing in other countries. But of course, other factors should be considered in investing abroad, one of which is actually exchange rate. We all know that there is a big disparity between peso and other foreign currencies, especially dollars and euro, di ba? Is it true na 1 dollar or 1 euro can buy actually 1 kilo of rice dito sa Philippines pero 1 peso can only buy a kilo of headache tama ba <laughs> Well it depends no 
Also, we should also remember that corporations are subject to the minimum corporate income tax beginning on the fourth taxable year immediately following the year in such corporation commences its business operations. So, sa mga hindi aware kung ano ang MCIT, it is imposed on the gross income or simply gross profit compared to regular corporate income tax na based naman sa net taxable income. So, if you compute the corporate income tax for a particular year, you have to compare it with the minimum corporate income tax which and then whichever is higher. Kasi there are times that the corporation may incur loss and hindi makakapagbayad ng regular corporate income tax, that is the time it will be subject to minimum corporate income tax. And as provided by the CREATE Act, the MCIT is actually reduced to 1%. No? effective July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023. This is also a good move ng government kasi usually yung mga businesses ngayon, they may have gross profit or gross income okay, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Kahit paunti-unti may, may benta, pero yung bottom line is net loss pa din. E if 2% pa yung MCIT na babayaran, it's an added burden pa sa kanila. No? So, the government has also considered the effect of COVID-19 and probably projected that the recovery of businesses may be until, unfortunately, 2023 or at a later date. As we proceed with Section 28, this is regarding the tax rates of foreign corporations. For resident foreign corporations prior to the CREATE Act, the prevailing corporate tax rate was 30%, no? but it is now 25% under the CREATE Act, effective July 1, 2020. Pero remember na straight 25% and tax rate. Regardless if their net taxable is income is below or let's say 5 million or below or their total assets not exceeding 100 million. The lower MS, ME rate of 20%, no? 20% corporate income tax does not apply to resident foreign corporation. And also as to computation of the exact rate for taxable year 2020, um, that will be based on the BIR's implementing rules and regulations. The CREATE Act also removed the 15% gross income tax on corporations, okay, similar to the one removed under domestic corporations no, previously discussed. Also, remember that I have discussed the 2% MCIT on domestic corporations. It was reduced to 1%. It also applies to resident foreign corporations, effective July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023. Also, the CREATE Act removed the following provisions on offshore banking units. This means the offshore banking units are now classified as resident foreign corps subject to 25% regular corporate income tax and 1%, no? 1% MCIT. So this is just a continuation of the provision removed under the offshore banking units. We also have the tax on RHQ and ROHQ, okay? As provided by Republic Act No. 8756 where it deals with RHQ and ROHQ, as we all know kapag regional or area headquarters established in the Philippines, these are multinational companies and they do not earn or derive income from the Philippines. And yung RHQ or, or area headquarters, they only act as supervisory, communications, and coordinating centers for their affiliates, subsidiaries, or branches in the Asia-Pacific region and other foreign markets. In such case, exempt sila definitely from RCI, regular corporate income tax, and MCIT kasi nga wala silang income. But for regional operating headquarters, so the distinction is the word operating. Kapag ROHQ, it shall be subject to a tax rate of 10% of their taxable income prior to the effectivity of the CREATE Act. Pero it says actually in the, in the Act that effective July 1, 2022, those regional operating headquarters shall be subject to the regular corporate income tax of 25%. It may, uh, it already actually somehow amended the previous law on ROHQ. We also have to discuss this portion as to tax on certain income by resident foreign corporations. We know that in the train law, interest on foreign currency deposit system received by individuals and domestic corporations are subject to 15%, which previously was subjected to 7.5%. 
Pero the same was not applied actually to resident foreign corporations. So in this CREATE Act, they already included the increase of the tax on interest from foreign currency deposit system from 7.5% to 15%. Okay? We also have this portion in the train law where the capital gains on sale of shares of stock not traded in the stock exchange is subject to 15% if received by individuals and corporation but actually it did not include a resident foreign corporation before sa train law. But in the CREATE Act, okay, included na yung change of rate. If you can recall, the capital gains on sale of shares of stock not listed in the stock exchange was graduated. So it means that if the capital gains on the sale does not exceed uh, 100,000, it will be subject to 5%. And if more than 100,000 yung capital gains, it will be subjected to 10%. But with the current rule, it is fixed at 15% of the capital gains. We also have the revision on tax on non-resident foreign corporations. We should know the difference between resident foreign corporation and non-resident foreign corporation as I discussed earlier. If the corporation is a resident foreign corporation, the regular corporate income tax rate is 25%, okay, based on the net taxable income, and then it will be compared with the MCIT or the minimum corporate income tax based on gross income. But for non-resident foreign corporations, they are outright subject to 25% based on their gross profit without deductions effective January 1, 2021. Pero ano yung distinction sa dalawang foreign corporations? Yung resident foreign corporation is a corporation established abroad and also registered here in the Philippines by securing the license to do business. Okay? As to the non-resident foreign corporation, it is also established abroad but they did not secure any license to do business in the Philippines and may be doing only isolated transactions in the Philippines like receiving interest tended to Philippine entities. We also have the tax on intercorporate dividends so that the rate on intercorporate dividends received by non-resident foreign corporation is actually 15% provided that um, the country in which the non-resident foreign corporation is domiciled shall allow a credit against the tax due from the non-resident foreign corporation taxes deemed to have been paid in the Philippines equivalent to 15%, which previously 20%. And effective July 1, 2020, the credit against the tax due shall be based on the revised rate previously discussed, which is 25%. So this is just a realignment of the tax credit as a result of the change of corporate tax rate. So similar also to what was discussed, the CREATE Act included the change of rate of capital gains uh, tax on sale of shares of stock not traded in the stock exchange of a non-resident foreign corporation. So instead of the previous 5% and 10% rule, it's now fixed at 15% of the capital gains. Let us now proceed with section 34, which is deduction from gross income. As I always discuss in my seminars, if a taxpayer, whether individual or corporation, claims expense, it should not only comply with the GAAP rules if what we are dealing with is the preparation of income tax returns. There are rules that differ between GAAP and tax rules. And as taxpayer claims, let's say, deductions for tax purposes, the basic rules are the following. Ito yung tatandaan ninyo, no? In, as you claim expenses, it must be necessary and ordinary substantiated by receipt or invoice, not contrary to law, moral, public order, public policy, and subject to withholding tax if applicable, if you want to claim it as deductible expense for tax purposes. Pero actually, there are other rules or limits on certain deductions, but in the CREATE Act, it added certain provisions na dapat noon pa na ilagay. No? Uh, take note, these changes apply to both individuals and corporations claiming deductible expenses. And that is the additional deduction from taxable income equal to one half of the value of the labor training expenses incurred for skills development of enterprises trainees. Okay? But we have to remember that the individuals employed should be enrolled in public senior high school, public higher education, in, in higher education institutions or public 
technical and vocational institutions and duly covered actually by an apprenticeship agreement. Take note, this has been included in the Labor Code of the Philippines as tax deduction. It is just now that it is included as a concrete deduction for tax purposes. But the additional criteria that we have to comply if you want to claim this additional expense is that the taxpayer shall secure certification okay, from DepEd, TESDA, or CHED and, shall, and such deduction shall not exceed 10% of the direct labor wage. It also means na kapag kumuha ka ng students from UP or PUP, for example, which are public higher educational institutions, the training expense incurred for those students will be entitled to 50% additional tax deduction. Pero syempre, as I mentioned, may 10% limit pa rin based on the direct labor wage. Kasi baka halos lahat na lang apprenticeship. And you will ask me, how much ba dapat pasweldo kapag apprenticeship? Well, for the information of all, if you get an apprentice in your company as provided by the labor code, you are required to pay them an amount not lower than 75% of the applicable minimum wage. So, is this a good way of increasing your workforce and productivity? Well, actually, it depends. We also have the change on the deduction of interest income subject to final tax under Section 34B1 of the tax code. No? We know that in terms of interest expense, it will not be outright claimed as deductible expense as provided by the CREATE Act. If a taxpayer has interest income subject to final tax, such as interest from bank deposit subject to 20% final tax, such interest will be reduced by 20% of the interest income, which previously 33%, no? Ang gamit na deduction. So the so nagkakaroon ng arbitrage between the interest expense and interest income. And the CREATE Act added this provision that in case the rate on the interest income subject to final tax is changed or adjusted, the interest expense will be adjusted also based on the prescribed formula. So this is self-explanatory naman. Let us now proceed with one of the tax-saving methods in terms of investment in corporation, no? Through exchange of property. So take note, the train law has already declared the tax-free exchange under Section 40C of the tax code is exempt from VAT. But the, in the CREATE Act, it added certain provisions and added uh, definitions on the tax-free ex tax exchange. One is the emphasis on the uh, participation of a corporation in a uh, reorganization through exchange of property. This portion uh, remains the same on the party to a reorganization. And letter B is now revised to read as the acquisition by one corporation in exchange solely for all or a part of its voting stock or in exchange solely for all or part of the voting stock of a corporation which is in control of the acquiring corporation of stock of another corporation if immediately after the acquisition the acquiring corporation has control of such other corporation whether or not such acquiring corporation had control immediately before the acquisition this expounds the pre previous provision and the exchange of corporations voting shares of stock where it resulted to gain control over the acquired corporation Letter C was also revised to indicate that the acquisition by one corporation in exchange solely for all or a part of its voting stock or in exchange solely for all or part of the voting stock of, the, of a corporation which is in control of the acquiring corporation of substantially all of the properties of another corporation in exchange is solely for stock, the assumption by the acquiring corporation of a liability of the other shall be disregarded. This emphasizes actually the acquisition of one or single corporation in exchange of full or partial voting stock of a corporation of another, but this also indicates that the assumption the liability of the other corporation is disregarded. We also have a new provision in this section defining recapitalization which means that the stock and bonds of a corporation are readjusted as to amount, income, or priority or an agreement of all stockholders and creditors to change 
and increase or decrease the capitalization or debts of the corporation or both. So it may include revaluation of the stocks and bonds involved, including the order of priority. We also have this added definition of reincorporation, which means the formation of the same corporate business with the same assets and the same stockholders surviving under a new charter. Is this possible, forming the same business entity? Yes, I encountered one instance na nag-50 years na yung corporation pero hindi pa nakapag-extend ng life. So, in law, it should cease to operate. Pero nag-register ulit sila using the same name, recognizing the same assets and stockholders, but different SEC registration na. So, this portion is rephrasing the provisions on the persons, alone or together not exceeding four persons but it also added a revised emphasized phrase okay so the transferor or transferors collectively gains or maintains control of the said corporation but what is also important in this tax rate exchange is the next slide which is an emphasis that as indicated in the train law in 2018 where sale or exchange of property used for business for shares of stock covered under this subsection shall not be subject to value-added tax. This is also the highlight of the section wherein all tax-free exchanges will no longer require prior Bureau of Internal Revenue confirmation or ruling. No? This has been a concern of a lot of tax-free exchange transaction of entities. Nagkakaroon ng delay sa transfer of property to a corporation because of the ruling. Okay, We just have to understand uh, that the BIR has limited number of personnel to review the applications. Kaya there's a possibility na may delay. But I would like to mention also, a one-person corporation may also have a bearing or impact on this tax-free exchange. But that will be discussed in our future webinar detailing the effects of one-person corporation. This is also a revised provision in the CREATE Act where it added the phrase after the transfer of property emphasizing that control should only be after the said exchange. And it also emphasized that uh, it is the collective and not individual ownership of all classes of stocks entitled to vote of the transferor or transferors under the section shall be used in determining the presence of control. It means that the persons exchanging the properties or shares of stock should be considered as a whole and not individually in determining gain or control after the exchange. We also have Section 57 emphasizing the Department of Finance power to review at least once every three years the withholding tax rules implemented by the BIR because any change in the tax rates may also have significant impact on the withholding tax, no? creditable withholding tax. As we all know that creditable withholding tax is just an advance payment or an estimated tax payment and not full settlement of that tax liability. So the rates should be reasonable and proportionate. Kasi baka mas mataas pa yung creditable withholding tax compared sa tax na babayaran which might result to overpayment. And ang recourse ng taxpayer is to apply for a refund or tax credit certificate which it will actually adversely and materially impact the taxpayer. I also presented this portion on the VAT exempt transactions of the enrolled bill of the Congress but actually vetoed by the President. No, For information purposes only but not for implementation. To give you a background, the threshold for sale of real properties has been revised several times in order to adjust with, with the cost of living and inflation. And in 2018, the train law had already made a revision on the threshold on this matter. Pero nasama din sa CREATE bill where it indicates that the sale of residential lot will be considered as VAT exempt if the value is not more than 2.5 million pesos, while for house and lot and other residential dwellings, such as let's say condo, the value should not exceed 4.2 million pesos in order to be classified as VAT exempt. But this was actually vetoed by the President on the ground actually that the intention of such exemption is to address the concern of the poor. Pero yung threshold na nailagay is too high that it may have also included the high income earners. So in effect, the previous rule should be followed which is presented actually in the next slide. So this is a portion of the train law to emphasize the train law in 2018 where it states that beginning January 1, 2021, the VAT exemption shall only apply to sale of real properties not primarily held for sale to customers or held for lease in the ordinary course of trade 
for business sale of property utilized for socialized housing as defined in Republic Act 7279, sale of house and lot and other residential dwellings, take note, with the selling price of not more than 2 million pesos. So we will only consider na VAT exempt yung sale of house and lot and other residential dwellings if the selling price is not more than 2 million pesos. No, There was an issue pa nga na na before sa train law kasi in 2011, mas mataas na yung threshold which was 3,199,200 for house and lot. And then binaba ni train law. Pero we just have to follow the existing law which is the train law. Okay? This portion was also vetoed in relation to the to the 2.5 million and 4.2 million threshold mentioned earlier. Also, I would like to show you a portion of the exempt transaction that is now revised and effective, which is letter R of section 109 of the tax code. Okay? The exemption now includes the sale, importation, printing, or publication of a uh, journal or any such reading uh, educational reading material covered by the UNESCO agreement on the importation of educational, scientific, and cultural materials, including actually the digital or electronic format. So this also recognizes that digital reading materials commercially sold is exempt from value of the tax, but it also removed the requirement that such materials should appear at regular intervals with fixed prices for subscription and sale, but gave an emphasis that the materials should be uh, not be devoted principally to the publication of paid advertisements. Also, another revised portion of Section 109 is the sale of or importation of prescription drugs and medicines for cancer, mental illness, tuberculosis, and kidney diseases. It's supposed to be exempt beginning January 1, 2023, but now will take effect beginning January 1, 2021. Well, actually, this is also the most reasonable and wisest revision, I believe, in this CREATE Act. We should not delay exemption on certain medicines, drugs, on such illnesses that has greatly affected uh, the Filipinos, okay? Considering these medicines are already expensive, lalo na kung may 12% VAT. So, we should give priority to the health care of our citizens. Baka maraming mag-comment na mababawasan talaga ang mga Pilipino na mabubuhay sa mundo kung mahal pa ang pagpapagamot. Okay, so let's now proceed also with other slides. We also have this revised section 109BB where it exempts beginning January 1, 2021 to December 31, 2023. The sale or importation of the following in battling COVID-19. So number one is capital equipment. It's spare parts and raw materials necessary for the production of personal protect protective equipment such as coveralls, gowns, surgical cap, surgical mask, N95 mask, scrub suits, goggles and face shield, double or surgical gloves, dedicated shoes and shoe covers for COVID-19 prevention. So we can see that the projection may be until 2023 where COVID-19 is already controlled or hopefully eradicated. Kaya lang mag So it means we should be prepared and we should pre orient ourselves already that even this kind of learning will be always online and not face-to-face -face until 2023. Also, the sale or importation of all drugs vaccines and medical devices specifically prescribed and directly used for the treatment of COVID-19 and drugs for the treatment of COVID-19 by the FDA for use in clinical trials. We also have this revised provision, the sale or lease of goods or properties or the performance of services other than the transactions mentioned in preceding paragraphs, the gross annual sales and or receipts do not exceed 3 million pesos. So it is now section 109 CC because of the added provisions discussed earlier. Ito yung 3 million threshold on sales whether the taxpayer will be classified as VAT entity or percentage tax. We also have this provision wherein those engaged in businesses whose sales or revenues do not exceed the 3 million threshold that we discussed earlier na are originally subject to 3% percentage tax prior to the effectivity of the CREATE Act. But as mentioned here, effective July 1, 2020 until June 30, 2023, the rate shall be 1%.
So take note that there will be an impact on the taxes claimed as deductible expense in 2020 relating to this percentage tax. So it only means that there will be an adjustment for the second semester of 2020 by reducing the claim percentage tax and also recognition of the uh, additional tax credit. We also have this provision of the enrolled bill that was vetoed by the President. Well, actually, this is more on the application for refund on internal revenue taxes where it requires the BIR to grant the application for a, for a specific time. No, It shows in the slide that the BIR has to act on the application within 90 days from the date of complete submission of documents. However, this should be differentiated with value-added tax. So, iba to dun sa value-added tax na refund or TCC. For value-added tax, it is usually straightforward. The documents that will be uh, evaluated will be official receipts and invoices lang. However, in this particular case, as to the refund of taxes, it would require the examiner to identify the revenues or sales, whether it's taxable or exempt, and determine if all of the expenses claimed are allowable deductions. So it only means greater yung scope than the audit of value added tax. So the examiner will be required to audit the taxpayer and it may extend to more than 90 days no, as recommended. That's why it was vetoed by the president. So this is also the other portion of such vetoed provision. We also have section 290 where there is a change of the wording from chairman to chairpersons of course in relation to gender sensitivity. There is also an addition where it added the Congressional Oversight Committee's role of reviewing the performance of the Fiscal Incentives Review Board. 